I was thinking about this morning and couldn't really put pen to paper. It's just sometimes happened. But the question that came to me was, why more? Why more? You know, again, there's, there's, there's people in this room that if, if they weren't directly involved, they were born in the era or their father or mother, or there's always someone who's been affected. I mean, many remembering that today with tears and grief. You've seen the interviews. If only we could preserve such men and hear of their voices. I believe that the children should sit at these men's feet and hear of the old times and know what it was. Know what it was that they went through. Know what it was that they had to sacrifice. Know what it was to, to understand that they, they didn't go to Ikea and just have a credit and just have everything that they wanted. That they were, they were days of what you have was what you had. And now we live in a, a world which is so fast-tracked and whether you have money or not, you can really have really what you want and pay for it later. But the question still remains, why war? Now we know, do we know, that Jesus said that there will be wars and rumours of wars. I don't know a time where I'm not in this story by a long, long way, trust me. But I know that we have lived in time of constant war and constant battle. Constant fighting. We still do. And the reality is this, we have not learned from our past. We so make the same mistakes over and over again. So why war? Have you ever been on your travels, on your daily life, on, on those doing work and living out your Christian life, and whether it be at work, whether it be at school, whether it be your people in your own family, or whether it be, as, as we have been asked many times, when we go into the open air in particular. How on earth, friend, can there be a God when there is such hurt, such calamity going on? How can there be a God when there is wars? Ever been asked that? How, how, how can there be a God when my child dies? How can there be a God when I went through this? I want to say to you this morning, I think it's a fair question. But a question we must be willing to answer. Because if you've not been asked it, I would ask yourself, why not? Why have you not been asked it? I will not try to attempt the answer to that, but there is a good reason you haven't been. So let's this morning, by God's help, try to answer why war? Why such evil? Why such calamity? We cannot go anywhere else, in my view, but the first chapter of Romans. Let us go there.
to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from creation of the world are clearly seen. Being understood by this, sorry, by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not. As God, neither glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. And their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image. Made like to corruptible man and to birds and to four footed beasts and creeping things. Verse 24. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness or uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust towards one another. Men with men working that which is unseemly. And receiving in themselves that which recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Verse 29 says this, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, Backbiters and haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure. In them that do them. What a powerful, powerful piece of scripture. I don't know how you feel this morning, but I feel this. As I read through this, I'm sure yourself, like myself, have read this more times than you would even dare to guess. But we are experiencing all what we read. We see it not only being done, but celebrated. Not only celebrated, but tolerated. Not only tolerated, but encouraged. A day that is evil indeed. We see as has been mentioned, that the world and its creation has been handed over to the intelligence of man. Man now claim glory in their knowledge to think that they know all about how this world came to be. The Bible is very clear and simple that God spoke it into motion. So even in that we have elevated ourselves above God. We have laid aside his word. There's a denial. 
within the hearts and the minds of mankind when they look out to the great creation the wonderful things that we see even locally the science of the body the beauty of the sky the greenness of the grass it's all God yet we have an agenda to give it over to what we call evolution or mother nature never call it mother nature it's not mother nature it's the hands of God and the voice of God who created these things it says that In, in verse 20 it says for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are, are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and his Godhead he has shown us even in creation he has shown us he has shown us his glory he has shown us his Godhead he has shown us who he is in his eternal power but we Thinking instead of that question, why, why such calamity? Why, what, how on earth can we profess, or, or how can we be a people who, who speak of a God who is all love, yet all around us we see death? It's easy to comment when it's not so personal. When these things become personal, when we when we're involved, when we see God and His power and the rebellion of man all around us and the outworkings of sin so close to us, it's not so easy to comment, is it? Let us try and answer that question as we read these verses. Why war? Why such evil? One thing we must understand, dear friends, is by nature, because of Adam's pride and Eve's decision to rebel against the perfect plan of God, sin was to be found in us. It says in further on in the book of Romans that we're at enmity with him. We don't want him. We have preferred the creature rather than the creator. We have said, just like Israel said, what did Israel demand? What did Israel demand? <coughs> a king. Let us have how we have it. You know what their hearts were? Let us have a king like the rest of the countries around us. Let us have a king. That, was not, that wasn't God's plan for them. And we have said, give us a king. But the king that we want is you and me. We want to rule. We want to reign. We want to do it how we want to do it. And in the end, God has said, there you go, have your way. Have your way. Have it, have it how you want it. You rule, you reign. You do what you so please. You, you, you go on your daily life. And we have the results. In a few weeks' time, we'll talk about human will. By God's help, we'll talk about it. But let me say to you, by nature and because of the fall, the only will that we can have is to choose sin. And this is the result. Pride, arrogance, loss, sexual perversities. You cannot go out in your daily life now without being, being uh, forced into having to look at these things daily. So the question we must answer is, why is it like this? Well, we've answered it, have we not? We don't want God. We do not want God. And the results are what we see. 
the evil of our day is not just because of this or because of that. It's because we have rejected God and his ways. So someone comes and asks you, says, why? Why is it like this? Simple answer is this, we rejected God. We didn't want his ways for us. We wanted to eat of the tree, didn't we not? It was full of pride and arrogance. And we find ourselves never learning. Verse 28 says, And as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. You know, when we look at this man, I don't know him fully. Harry, his name, I don't know him at all. I might have followed him. <laughs> when I've sat with older people, whether it be in their homes or or whether you just have the privilege of meeting them. It's something that this generation don't have. Generally. We've lost something. We've lost something. Now we know that every, we're going to read it, all of sin and far short of the glory of God. But as time goes on, just those things that we read and see in verse 29, unrighteousness, we see it like never before, fornication, fornication, you see again, and I speak with respect, some of us will remember when those fought sex before marriage and all the rest of it would have been would have been anathema. Now we're way beyond that. Forget fornication, that's of old. That that was just one of the manifestations of sin. But now that none of that matters. It doesn't matter. Wickedness. I give you poor examples I know. Halloween. Now, when I was a child, I wasn't allowed to do it. It wasn't really a big thing. But if it was going on, it was a sheet, you know, a sheet over the head and a party popper and a little trip. But today, today, it's daggers and blood and evil. That's just, that's the smaller thing. When I was a child, and again, I did not promote this to celebrate nor to, nor to justify. But when I was a child, I'm 36, by the way, I think, 36, 36. My rebellion was scrumping and jumping hedges and knocking on a door and running off. But the thought of going home and knowing that my dad knew, or, or thought that I'd be found out, I had fear. You're nodding your heads because you know what I'm talking about. Of course I don't say to justify such things. But now what we have is malice. And evil. Rebellion. And I'll tell you what, if we live in our trust children, you listen to me. No matter how old you are. And we see it. As one of the things in this list, and it's repeated, I believe, in Timothy, children who are disobedient to parents. Let me tell you something. Such thing dishonors God. But we have it. We have, we have this parenting now where, and I've said this before, and I trust that you will understand what I'm trying to do and say. We have this kind of let's do a deal with a child so that they might do what they've been asked to do. If you do this, can you, you will have that. But how about this? Do it. Because you're told to do it. Why? Because the Bible says so. Because it's for your God. We live in a strange, strange time. Most children are on the house now. And I don't say it's a perfect parent. Not by a long shot. We 
Lord, help us. Covetousness. Maliciousness. Full of envy. Murder. <coughs> you put your news on when you get back and you hear of another murder. Let me tell you something. Maybe yours like mine, your heart and mind are getting conditioned to hear such things. We're not surprised anymore. No? Homosexuality. Do you know the power that that has right now? Is massive. Do you know what? It's godlessness. It's evil. Yet it's rain. Men are not men anymore, women are not women anymore. Because they've been handed over. This is where I'm going. We've been handed over. And what it's doing is it's bringing in that great day. As we said, as we met to prayer on Monday, it's bringing in that day where Christ will come again and put an end to it all. Do we cry out, church, this morning, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus? Do you, do you like me feel where I don't belong here? Do you feel like you belong here? Because if you do belong here, if your if your mind is set to to um, temporal things, if your mind is set to those things which gratify the flesh and not the spirit, it is quite possible that this morning that you have not met with God. What pleases you? What satisfies you? Does it break you? Does it? Do, do you cry? Do you? Do you become almost speechless in your prayers over this? Backbiters. And in verse thirteen, I'm just picking some out. to be honest in your life if you could think of the amount of people you could really trust you could quite possibly do it on one hand at best because everybody's out for themselves haters of God let me say something on that point that's where you we are found outside of Christ, haters of God, not sent, not seeker sensitive, not victims, but rebellious people against the holy God. They hate God. They hate Him. The despiteful and the proud and the boasters. And do you know what it says? I don't know what it says in your translation. I've got the King James version, and it says this: inventors. Of evil things. That means evil is ever growing. Not it wasn't fornication. Now it's perversion. It's growing. Sin is growing. Covenant breakers. Without natural affection. Do you walk through the streets particularly and see? It's not only the young people, by the way. And I say this to, to defend them. I'm going to defend the young for a moment. And my own experience only. When Miss Alvin Russell and others have been in the streets, the, the, the people who give us the most hassle are not those yobbo looking young lads. It's often, and forgive me, the older generation who thinks they know better. So let us not just label the young as the haters of God, or the disobedient. It is throughout the whole of mankind. For there is, without doubt, that which it says here, there is, without natural affection, there's a callousness, there's, there's a coldness. Dog eat dog. There are things that I'm saying to you 
see that that's the world that we live in. Unmerciful. No mercy. You see, we could go on and paint an even worse picture than it is. But today, in reality, we stand and remember for two minutes, rightly, and honour such men and families and women and children, rightly honour and remember them. But what we must dare to do. And it is my, my sadness that at most of these memorial services, Christ will not be preached. A great opportunity out there as I speak to preach Christ. And it's not being done. The answer to all of them. Because we stand and remember, but we must get to the root issue. We did this. We're guilty. We caused it. It says, doesn't it, as we turn the pages of this great epistle to the Romans, for all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone, you, me, person sat next to you, this person sat behind you, the womb that you came out of, you were conceived in iniquity. These things you've heard and know, but when you're asked such a question, when you're asked such a question, why such a state? Why are we in such a mess? The answer is clear from the scriptures. We prefer the creature rather than the creator. And this is the results. This is the results. But thank God, this morning, we don't stay there. We don't, we don't stay there. Let us turn to, to Romans 5. In fact, let's stay Romans 3 just for a moment. <clears throat> for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 24, being justified freely by his grace. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Yes, I want to say to you this morning, yes, honour these men. Honour what they did. Honour that they had the courage. Honour that they had the boldness. Honour that they got up that morning and went knowing they were never coming back. Honour them, learn it, know it. But let me say to you this morning before all of that, know this, that today we celebrate the redemptive, redeeming, sacrificial, substitutionary atonement of our Lord Jesus Christ. The greatest ever sacrifice that was ever made. While we were yet still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. He paid a price. He laid it down. Sacrifice. I want to say to this morning, if you're going to learn anything regarding Christ, learn about the substitutionary work. Learn about it, read about it, listen to it. Because that's what we celebrate this morning. Whom God, verse 25, hath set forth to be a propitiation. Now, that wrath can be turned into grace. To propitiate, he's propitiated for you. He has taken the place and he has had on him. He who knew no sin bore the sin of many. He shall see the fruit of his travail, Isaiah says. He came and did this glorious, propitious work through his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins. Listen this morning, if you have called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have been born again of the Spirit, you have remission of sins, removal of your sins. They've been dealt with. Through the forbearance of God, 
to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Romans 5 verse 1, Therefore being justified by faith, we sang, did we not, that song, not by the law, not by the works of your own hands, Thank God it's not by the works of our own hands. Come on in. Come on in. We're just discussing the greatest sacrifice. That we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And hope, listen to this, hope, hope, maketh us not ashamed. Why? Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Now listen to this, for when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now listen to this. For scarcely for a righteous man one will die. Yet perhaps for a good man some would even dare to die. But verse 8, God commanded his love towards us in that while we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. As we've gone through this morning, the great things that these men, women, families sacrificed. Incredible. May God save us from having to make ever such decisions as that. Not and respect them. Teach these things our children. But let us teach them these things. To die for another person. He says one might do that for, for a good person. I'll tell you something, if someone comes someone comes into my house, I'm going to stand before my family and I'm going to die for them. And you would all join me, no doubt, in saying such a thing. But what about this? What about your enemy? It's all right to do to do that for the people you love, but here what we see the redeeming work of Christ is while you and I were still living in our pride, still living in our selfishness, still living in our idolatry, and do not please don't don't try to uh, rid yourself of such such um, guilt, because you and I by nature are idolatrous. Because the throne of our hearts is you. It's not a golden calf. It's you. It's pride, it's lust, it's arrogance. But in, even while this was still the case, in his great predetermined plan for salvation, Christ died for the ungodly. What a sacrifice. What a sacrifice. He commanded his love, he commanded it, it says in my Bible, he commanded his love towards us. This is love. So we're going to break bread. And we're going to read a scripture that will be read countless times this morning throughout this nation. Trust you know where I'm turning. John 15, verse 13. You could read the whole chapter this morning. I'm just going to focus on this one verse. Greater love. Hath no man than this, that a man lay his life down for his friends. 
Now as I repeat them for the benefit really of those who have come in. How we should honour such men who have done things like this. And it's not only in wars, but it's protective of those whom they love. Should we not stand and honour such men for two minutes? Absolutely we should. The sad thing that is missing in many, many of the services that will go on is that we don't come to this great climax. But while we were found in sin and pride, Christ died for the ungodly. He laid his life down, dear friends. He took our place. He took our place. Men went out to war so we so we can do what we're doing now. I believe that the sacrifice of that. The sacrifice that we're concentrating on just for these moments is eternal. The results of it are eternal. <coughs> that he died. That he became man. Philippians 2 says. Even that is great humility. That he was he was willing to be born in the likeness of man. What well, not only that, even death, the death of the cross. What a sacrifice. In order to what? Purchase your salvation. So this morning, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your salvation, for your salvation, and for your eternal peace, peace, if you have peace with God this morning, if you have peace with God this morning, then you have joy. There's nobody Nobody, no height, no depth, nor any other thing, can take that away from you. Purchased by the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Colin, would you share that with your side, please?